So, Mr. Baxter, how did you get your start in radio? <laughs> well, you know, I, I was fortunate because I started as a junior in college, okay? And what happened was when I uh, first went to Norfolk State University, the Norfolk State University, I might add, um, I went there to play basketball. I got injured. And what happened was I went back to my dorm and I was really depressed, but I turned on the station, the, the college station. I heard this guy on the radio and I was like, wow, I can do that. And I kept listening to him and I got even more confidence uh, after listening to him because I said to myself, this guy really sucks. And I knew I could do better than him. And I went over to the station and that's how my career really started simply because I was just hanging around the station. I put myself in a position to really say, hey, you know, if you guys ever need me, then use me. One night, the general manager got into an argument with his wife. And the person that was supposed to show up for the next shift did not show up. So he said, hey, Morris, you said you want to be on radio? Here's your opportunity. Because I got to go home and deal with my wife and the other guy didn't show up. Here's turntable one, turntable two, and the microphone. Have at it. And that was the beginning of my career in radio. Well, can you talk about your book, The Morris Code, 21 Ways Something Good is Going to Happen to You Today, in its relation to your morning show, Morris Motivations? You know, it's so great, and I'm so glad you asked me that, simply because I believe that everybody should have a mantra, and that mantra should be something that gets them motivated. And what gets me motivated is, one, I wake up, when I wake up in the morning, the first person I thank is God. The second thing I say is the Morse code. And the Morse code is something good is going to happen to me today. The format of your show is something different to me. The positivity just speaks volumes. What kind of feedback have you received from your listeners? <laughs> you know, it, it's been unbelievable. Um, one thing I will tell you about this is, is that everybody has a purpose and I was so fortunate to be able to find my purpose. Um, it happened when I was 40 years old and I was listening to the late Coretta Scott King and she spoke on purpose and that's when it really hit me what my purpose was. It was something that I was always doing but I never really qualified it and that is to empower and enlighten and that's God's will. And that's how I related to my morning show, because this is the gift that I've been given to make sure that I can really push people forward. One of the most rewarding things is to make people feel good. But when it comes to what I receive, I really believe that as long as you're humble, you never stumble. You mentioned that you listened to Coretta Scott King and her message about purpose. Were there any other black radio hosts that, you know, you looked up to? Yes, career. yes, yes, yes. It was so many, and I got to tell you, being from Detroit, there was this uh, radio announcer that I think still to this day was the best radio personality in the history of radio, and that's just my opinion. His name was the world's electrifying mojo, and this guy came on at midnight, and he had something called the Midnight Funk Association. Had a lot of sound effects. Whenever he signed off, he always had a sound effect of a helicopter. And he would make it seem as, he, as if he was in the helicopter flying over the city saying goodnight to everybody. It was theater of the mind, and that's what really got me into radio. Why do you think it's important to have black voices like yours on the radio, especially when it comes to sending a positive message? Well, it's really important if you think about it, especially... I'm speaking for the brothers now. There are a lot of black men that are not really being recognized. And it seems like we are slowly being annihilated. And I think our presence is something here that is valuable to this world. And it's so important that we are still, it's so important that we're able to be able to be in the forefront and be able to let people know who we really are, the true leaders and kings. Do you think black radio and black black men's voices in radio played a role in the upbringing of black people in America? If so, how so? Yeah, it did. And what happened was, is that the unfortunate truth is, we um, got uh, regulated. So 
the mom and pop radio stations of, of back in the day are no longer because it's all been um, it's all been put into corporations. So in other words, Radio Ones of the world, the clear channels of the world, has stifled our communication and growth as a black community because the the corporations have all become conglomerates and now we don't have a standalone station in the event that there's something that we need to, uh, an agenda we need to push forward in our community. We aren't able to do that because it's now being monopolized by the corporations such as Clear Channel and Radio One and the aforementioned. There's no doubt that you have one of the best radio voices that I've heard. Um, not only do you host, but you also do voiceover work as well. Can you talk about your career in that? Yeah, and I tell you what, um, first of all, thank you for that compliment. Second of all, I've had this voice since I was three years old. Um, the other thing is, is that when it comes to uh, the voice work, I really, uh, uh, it became, it, it, it almost seemed like it was natural for me. And then it became uh, one of necessity because I knew that if I really honed in on this voice and craft, that I could definitely benefit from it. So I started taking acting classes. I made sure that whenever I speak, that it is, um, it, it can be, uh, uh, it can resonate the way it should resonate with the words that come out of my mouth. So when it comes to the voiceover. What you hear is um, the blessing from God up above, and I've been able to take it and, and monopolize and be able to monetize. You've worn many different hats in your career, but how did you end up here at WCLK? Oh, man, that's a great question. Okay, after I left the record label, Loud Sony Records, um, I, started, I did a weekly show called the Inside the Hawks. It was sponsored by the Atlanta Hawks. So I would come to the station uh, during the basketball season every Thursday and do a live show. After the season ended, the unfortunate uh, happened with the, the former morning show director, Bill Clark, he died. And what, uh, what happened was they had, uh, they had a search for a morning show. So the general manager, Wendy Williams, called me and said, Hey, Morris, I remember the good work that you did when you were here on the air with the Atlanta Hawks. How would you like to audition for the morning show? I could not believe what I was hearing. She said, however, there's going to be three other people that are going to be auditioning as well. And you all will have a week and then we'll decide who is the best and most suitable for the morning show. So I competed against uh, three other people. And at the end of the competition, uh, the staff here at WCLK and the listeners and members chose me. And that's how Morris in the Morning started. Do you think it was meant to be that you ended up here at WCLK? Absolutely. And the reason why I say that is because of the trials and tribulations that I've dealt with here has definitely been something that lets me know that I'm still supposed to be here, which is why I am here. And I believe everything happens for a reason. Um, it's all about staying in the divine flow. As long as you can stay in the divine flow, you will always reach your divine potential. Now, you also do work away from the mic. Um, can you talk about the work you do in the community? Yeah, so what I do is I, um, uh, I uh, really love teaching. So I have a... Uh, class at Kennesaw State University. It's a music business class and that is so rewarding because we do something a little bit different in that class because I want uh, the, the, the young folks like yourself to understand that life is not something where you sleepwalk. You have to have a vision. You just can't go through the routine. The best way to do that is is a vision board. You have an opportunity to create your own life and you can put it on a piece of cardboard in front of you that will lead you in the direction you need to go. Whether or not you uh, get off track or not, it will always keep you focused. So a vision board to me is one of the most important things that any young person should do. Also, can you talk about your work in the as one of the advocates for prostate cancer? Oh, wow. You know, I tell you, my dad uh, uh, and my father-in-law both had prostate cancer and you know uh, the statistics are startling simply because of the stuff that we're consuming the food the air that we're breathing 
uh, it's, it's important that we can um, really understand all of these things that are attacking our body and do the best we can to prevent from actually being a part of the, the and getting prostate cancer. So one of the most important things is to understand one in four people will get prostate cancer. That's a startling statistic. And as a result, it's something that made me uh, really take pause and say, hey, I want to make sure that I can do my part by getting information out to other gentlemen such as myself. Um, and now, because of the food, it's even more important because now they're saying that you should start testing for prostate as early as 40 years old. So uh, I think that that speaks volumes, and that's why I wanted to make sure that I did my part by being a personal personal advocate for prostate cancer. So if you ever see me out, I'll always ask if you've gotten your test. Now, to backtrack a little bit, you talked about how when you were at Norfolk State, you played basketball, but you got hurt. But you also spent some time in pairs and basketball was involved in that as well. Can you talk about your experience? One of the best experiences I've ever had in my entire life was being able to have an opportunity to go to Paris. At that time, it was 20 years ago, well, actually 25 years ago, a friend of mine played ball in the um, NBA, and he got a contract to play in Paris. And during that time, I was in Virginia, and I was out of work. And he was like, hey, uh, I don't have any friends over here. Nobody speaks English. You can come over to Paris and train me. I got room and board for you. And that's how it began for me in Paris. And that was one of the most enjoyable and most incredible experiences I ever had in my entire life to the point where uh, had I not got a job offer to come back from Paris to the States, I probably would still be over there. How long were you in Paris? A year. Um, well, and when you first came to Atlanta, you mentioned earlier too how you were with Loud and Sony Music. Um, and you work with hip hop legends like Wu Tang Clan, 3 Six Mafia, Mob Deep. But what was it like being in that room? Oh my gosh. Um, it was electric, and you were always, uh, what's the best way to put it? You were always ready because the hip hop world has so many different uh, things happening and moving parts at any time. So it definitely kept me sharp. <laughs> and you were featured on one of the artist's albums, correct? That is correct. And that was, uh, it's, it's my guy too, uh, a good friend of mine, um, Teddy Riley, Blackstreet. Let me do this. Jazz 91.9, Teen Town Weather Report. Hey, it's a great day for a Tuesday, not bad. All right, I'm just saying, highs today expected to reach 54 beautiful degrees. A little cloudy right now, and it's a little cool. You know, when it's cool and cloudy, it gives us a combination of cool outy. <laughs> okay, I make myself laugh, but that's all right. <laughs> Somebody's <laughs> laughing, I'm just saying. Somebody's smiling at least. I mean, come on, current temperature now, 41 degrees. You know, when you smile, it's the easiest way to spread your cheeks. Too soon, too soon. <laughs> well, anyway, whatever it takes to make you feel good. Maybe this. <laughs> so you were talking about Black Street. Oh, yeah. So, um, Teddy Riley. When he first started with a uh, guy, um, he came to the radio station when I was in Virginia. I was on the radio there, and I was his first interview with Guy and the group. And then he decided to move to Virginia Beach, and he opened up a studio, and he used to listen to me. And at that time, I was on doing hip-hop and R&B at night from 6 until 10. And he called me up and said, Morris, I want you to be on my album. And I was like, oh, Teddy, it's whatever. He's like, no, I'm serious. I want you to be on my album. And I was like blown away. My opportunity to be on an album. So I went to the studio and I could not believe it. It was real. It was happening. And I saw every artist in his studio singing and performing and going over back and forth and back and forth. One thing I learned from that process is Teddy Riley is a perfectionist. When it came to actually doing my part on that album, we probably did it about a hundred times. <laughs> but I get it. 
uh, was it necessary? For, for me, it was exciting, but I didn't think it was that necessary, but it turned out absolutely wonderful. So apparently he knew what he was doing and I was just there to be a part of it and was very glad to be a part of it as well. And it uh, proved to be beneficial for me as well, financially, because that album is now uh, 10 times platinum. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So now to come back to the present, some people may not know about WCLK being located on the campus of Clark Atlanta University. So every day you you get to see some of these students that aspire to be in your field of work one day. And how does seeing these students remind you of your college days in Norfolk State? Oh gosh, uh, you know, and, and, I, and I'm gonna tell you something, I'm a little biased right now simply because I'm just so proud of you and you. what you've been able to accomplish. And it's amazing. There are some students, as again, as I mentioned, that just sleepwalk through life. And then, and those students need help. And if I can, I'll guide them as best as I can. And then there's some that actually get it. I was one of those kids that got it. And I'll give you an example. I wanted to be on radio so bad that I used to just go to the commercial radio station and hang around, sit in the lobby. I would empty the garbage cans. And one day, I got a, a, a chance to work on the commercial station, similar to like a V103 here, during my junior year in college. And they offered me the job from one in the morning to seven in the morning overnight. The reason why I say that is, is simply because I saw a vision. I gave up all of my partying on the weekends, on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, to work on that station from one in the morning to 7 a.m. in the morning because I knew what it was gonna do for me. So with that desire, that's what I look for with other students that I run across. You're one of those students, and there are other students here that really get it. One of the things I'm really proud of in particular is uh, being able to help Madison Moffitt, who is a theater major, receive a $10,000 scholarship from MSNBC. It's situations like that and students like that that always stand out. They're the shining stars. And whenever I see that, it really, it's a delight because it's something that I saw in myself that I see in these future leaders. Well, Mr. Baxter, thank you for sitting down with me today and doing this interview. If there was one thing you had to say regarding Black History Month and Black Radio, what would that be? Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep it a buck, as the young folks say. And I'm gonna go to Cat Williams' interview with Shannon Sharp. And one of the things that stood out to me over all of the things that were said was that we don't put each other on. If there's anything that I can implore and ask that we really think about and also be able to see the vision is that we have to put each other on. The bottom line is, without vision, there will always be division. And then lastly, just give a positive message is what you do, can you give a positive message to the listeners? Yeah, and I gotta tell you, it's one of my favorite quotes from Confucius, and I think it's something that everybody should really keep in their back pocket. If you think about the past, it causes depression. If you think about the future, it causes anxiety. If you think about the present, you will always be at peace. Thank you. <laughs>